Professor Anupam. Let me begin by thanking Jessica for, uh, for Jessica Coates for being such a great host. Um, I am uh, honored to be here. It's a, truly a delight, and I've learned so much from my uh, couple days uh, in Canberra. Um, so I'm going to talk today about copyright versus internet question mark. Um, uh, so. A quarter century ago, many declared that the rise of the internet would end copyright. Uh, others warned that the laws fashioned to protect copyright were themselves going to uh, were, were, were themselves going to bar critique and lead to monopoly pricing. So here we see Jack Valenti at the um, in the House saying, without proper legal and environmental uh, legal and enforcement infrastructure, internet pri piracy will engulf the world's creative industry. Okay, the threat was was quite serious, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was one of the solutions in this context. But far from the end of either the internet uh, uh, or the end of copyright. Um, we see an, an era of both creativity and critique. The years since the emergence of the internet have been de described even as the global age of television, something like the second or third global age of television, uh, as it's been currently described. So um, others describe this as peak TV. Uh, and so the number of original scripted shows, this is a US I will talk often, and I apologize for this, in a very American style, uh, focusing on American information. So um, for, largely for lack of you know, great information about um, what's happening in the world. Um, so uh, you see here the rise of original scripted shows in the United States. Um, and uh, it includes uh, huge budget shows, uh, the Mandalorian, which has uh, budgets of $15 million per ep, and again, the, uh, the references will be to the US uh, uh, dollar, uh, $15 million um, it, per episode, and Game of Thrones, which had, by the time it finished, $15 million episodes uh, as well. So, um, and it produces uh, wonderful uh, things like uh, uh, Baby Yoda. Um, so from smartphones to web search to cloud computing, digital innovations have turned on their relationships to copyright law. But some seek today to undo the balance that created today's internet. And what's more, existing copyright law may not be sufficient, may not be ready for the next generation of innovations, from the internet of things to artificial intelligence. American style, uh, f uh, kind of limited fair use, which saved Sony's video cassette recorder, proved a lifeline for Silicon Valley companies as well. But when the United, S when other countries consider adopting fair use, the U.S. complains that this is ill, quote, ill considered. Okay, uh, and I'm not arguing for fair use here, and I, I very much appreciate uh, Minister Fletcher's uh, concerns about fair use. Um, and there are other ways to achieve similar things, and I think that's uh, I, I think his observations are quite uh, quite valid. Uh, but but it's fascinating that when we try to uh, when other countries try to do fair use, the United States finds it problematic. Uh, okay, so. Um, Automated enforcement of copyright can indeed undermine speech if AI systems fail to distinguish copying from critique. And this is one of the kind of important failures of AI in this context. Automated systems that, uh, that identify something as belonging to a rights holder can often fail to, uh, to recognize that those, those uses are in fact uh, uh, legal because they are critique or some other permitted uh, use of some other work. Um, and so um, extensive enforcement of copyright can also require widespread surveillance of internet activities, from deep packet inspection of university networks to non-anonymous use of Wi-Fi. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. 
Rights over um, APIs, application processing interfaces, can entrench existing software providers against future competitors. This is an issue currently that's going to be heard before the Supreme Court in the next month. Um, and so we, can, we have lots of concerns now with respect to the future. But let me first back up and talk about how we got here. Think about, return to the world of the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Sony, having inv invented the portable Walkman, was in, in, that, in that time, you know, poised to lead. It had a tremendous electronics uh, uh, power. Uh, and, but when it introduced the digital version of the Walkman, uh, it, it was called the, uh, the networked Walkman. Uh, it crippled the Walkman from the very get-go, the digital Walkman. Till too late, the digital Walkman could only play Sony's proprietary digital music format, a format that would guarantee that every tune played was duly licensed. Okay? Uh, so in order to make sure to protect copyright in this new digital world, Sony locked down both the computer that one used to communicate with its device and the device in ways that made it impossible to import anything except through very narrow, constricted means. Um, to upload music, you had to put your CD into the computer, and Sony's software would turn it into Sony's proprietary format once it was satisfied that you had a legal copy and then allow you to transfer it to your digital Walkman. To make doubly sure you didn't copy the CD more times than you should, uploading it to too many music players, as if you had lots of people coming through your house, you know, being handed your Sony uh, network player and you would be, uh, you know, slyly uploading it. Uh, they, Sony software burned itself into the root of your operating system, okay, to ensure that it couldn't be evaded. This was a trick often used by malware enterprises and therefore highly insecure as an activity. Uh, and so Sony actually violated uh, a lot of cybersecurity norms and ultimately faced huge class action litigation in the United States over this activity. So, uh, so when Steve Jobs uh, approached these similar devices, he did not have similar compunctions. After all, unlike Sony, Apple did not have a content arm. It didn't have an internal uh, studio that was telling Apple not to uh, engineer its products to be the best they could be. So when Apple introduced the iPod in 2001, it embraced MP3s. MP3 was, of course, the favorite format of Napster users, the coin of Napster. Um, and so the libraries that people had downloaded illicitly from the internet could now be uploaded to the iPod with a few mouse clicks. Apple's 2001 slogan, which you may remember, rip, mix, and burn, touted the Mac's facility in transferring music files among, uh, from uh, in various media. The iPod made that music collection mobile. Sony's flash drive-based music player had arrived in 1999, so it literally had a flash drive player in 1999, long before Apple's uh, flash drive player, uh, you know, would be, which would be introduced much later in the, uh, almost, almost 10 years later. But Apple's music player would come to dominate, largely because of ease of use. You could put music on it very easily. And of course, Apple also introduced, as, Prime Minister, uh, as Minister Fletcher uh, uh, suggested, uh, the important uh, ways to buy uh, particular single songs to load onto the device at a price point that competed with piracy. Okay, um, and so uh, so it, it Apple could leverage that domination in the music player business now to add a cellular phone to this device, venturing into the mobile phone business for the first time in 
in 2007. The irony of Sony's uh, uh, actions in this case is that Sony had fought for a legal precedent that enabled Apple to produce a device uh, with such possible uh, a possibilities for copyright pri and piracy. When Sony introduced a video cassette recorder, Hollywood studios sued because the device could copy television shows without permission. In its 1984 decision in, so in Sony uh, Corporation, sorry, this is a few things that I wanted to show you about uh, uploads on YouTube and um, uh, across the web. Uh, it's a huge amount of activity that we've seen. Um, and now what we see is that when Sony introduced uh, the, uh, when Sony introduced its VCR, Hollywood Studios sued because a device could copy television shows without permission. In its 1984 decision, the Supreme Court protected the new technology. It sided with the technology, arguing that the technology had substantial non-infringing uses, even though it could, as it acknowledged, be used to infringe copyright. As Pamela, as Pamela Samuelson writes, had it not been for the relief from liability offered by the Sony decision, tape recorders, photocopiers, CD burners, CD ripping software, iPods, MP3 players, and a host of other technologies that facilitate private or personal use, copying might have never become available. If she had written this a few years later, she would have added the iPhone to that list. So what we see is the, is the reality of the copyright risks that new technologies face. So any technology that allows individuals to share information lends itself to copyright infringement. So a company like Facebook or YouTube that allows individuals to post online faces a high risk that its service will be used for extensive copyright infringement. When you click upload, when you click share, you could easily be engaging in an act of copyright infringement. And the social media enterprise could have then be said to have contributorily infringed that underlying copyright. And in the United States, at least, there are statutory damages available for copyright infringement. There's also the argument that it, the, these companies are directly infringing copyright, as they are the ones directly copying, even if they're acting at the direction of someone else. Statutory damages for direct infringement range from 200 to 15, uh, $150,000 US uh, for each work. Uh, and given that millions of works are copied and shared online, the possible statutory damages would be enough to wreck any company, even one the size of Google um, or Facebook. In fact, there is a graveyard of dot-com enterprises that were hobbled exactly because of these concerns. So mp 3 iCraveTV.com, Aimster, Grokster, and most famously, of course, Napster. All of these companies failed because they did not actually use what the law would, would, what Congress would create for them, which are safe harbors. So the online uh, uh, liability limitation uh, act in, uh, in uh, Copyright Li uh, Infringement Liability Limitation Act in 1998 provided for four safe harbors. And you are all familiar with the safe harbors. I should mention that the fourth safe, har safe harbor will seem very forward looking. The fourth safe harbor is for internet search engines. At this time, Google didn't even exist. So Google is founded in 1998, okay? The same year as this statute comes into being, all right? Um, and at this time, it's, it's, thank you, Minister. Um, so at this time, it is so commonplace to rely upon these safe harbors in the United States that one scholar writes that it would be a breach of corporate fiduciary duty for a company not to comply uh, with the safe harbors. And returning to fair use, so we have the DMCA, the statutory uh, provisions that protect uh, certain categories of information uses, but we also have fair use. And I also, I just wanted to talk a little bit about 
uh, fair use in this context. And I know that you can't necessarily read all this text. Google introduced image search in the year 2001. It was, there's a wonderful backstory to image search. In the year 2000, Jennifer Lopez wore a green dress to the Grammys. And that dress was so highly, uh, pictures of Jennifer Lopez wearing the dress uh, basically were, were uh, uh, the most searched for item during a certain period in 2001. And so what people wanted was not when they would search for Jennifer Lopez, they would want a picture um, and not just uh, the, uh, the sites that had references to Jennifer Lopez. And so what Google did was it created image search a year later. Okay. And what this did was essentially copied all the world's images that are available on the internet and made them available for you to search. So it provided a kind of card catalog system to all the world's images. Okay. And it did so without any statutory authority that was clear. It did so on the strength of the fact that if the case were brought before a court, the court would find that those actions would constitute fair use. Um, this was one of the many bet the company moments that, that uh, Google lawyers allowed during the course of its development. Uh, that is, if it had been, not been able to do this, the statutory liabilities would have been, uh, would have been enough to, uh, to swallow up the value of the company. But of course, when it was challenged, the courts upheld Google's image search, uh, noting that the transformative use of, the, of these images uh, improved access to information on the internet. Fair use has been a critical part of the development of technology in the United States. So I mentioned the Sony VCR, uh, I, Google image search, it's also been fundamental to Google Books. So Google decided at some point we will take all the books and digitize them and make them searchable. And when tested, uh, the court wrote, Google Books is also transformative in the sense that it has transformed book text into data for purposes of substantive research, including data mining and text mining in new areas. Okay. So, this, as you can already see, is a basis for kind of artificial intelligence applications to come. Now, let me turn to other jurisdictions. So, this is a relatively new case from 2016 in Europe. So, Mr. McFadden runs a little lighting company. Um, and in the, con in the context of this lighting company, he decides to offer free Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, the, the German uh, translation of the Wi-Fi network is freedom instead of fear. Okay? The free part of this was very deliberate. Um, and so, so the question was taken to the high court of, of Europe, uh, whether or not because someone could use his Wi-Fi to infringe copyright by uploading or downloading copyright infringing material, was he liable as an aider and a better of potential copyright infringement on his Wi-Fi network? Okay. And the highest court ruled that yes, he could not take advantage of immunities for information service providers in this context because he had not password protected the Wi-Fi, okay? If he had password protected the Wi-Fi, then he would be able to give the password to individuals and note down who they were so that any illicit activity could be tied to that person, okay? Uh, I, was, uh, I had the privilege of speaking in Parliament yesterday and I noted that the Parliament network would not qualify under those rules. Okay, uh, and I was grateful for that. Uh, by the way, the, the Wi-Fi network here doesn't work. Just, it's just the library. <laughs> I, went, I do want to complain about that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
Okay, so, so, uh, so that is a, just an example from, that I wanted to share from, from Europe. And it's, it shows a little bit of the different approach that exists in Europe on these issues. Uh, the European approach is, uh, is less uh, likely to, uh, to side with uh, the technology and more likely to, uh, to often uh, make the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the technology flourish. Let me turn to Japan, Sony's home. So a case I often describe is the case of Izamu Kaneko, uh, who was a, a, pro a computer programmer and researcher, lecturer at the University of Tokyo. In, uh, in early 2003, he, uh, in 2002, he shared a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network. This, uh, this network became very popular, uh, and in 2003, some, uh, some, the police charged a man with uploading two, or I'm sorry, I think downloading two videos, uh, Unbreakable and A Beautiful Mind, two Hollywood movies. And so they convicted this person of this, uh, of this illegal copyright infringing activity. The following year, they charged Kaneko with distributing this software that allowed other people to share copyright infringing work, even knowing that the software allowed this. Okay. To show that he knew that the, the software allowed this, they pointed to the conviction obtained a year earlier. See, you have continued to circulate the software and allow it to be, down, uh, to be downloaded, even though you know people have used it to download two Hollywood movies and have been convicted for it. He was convicted of this in the, in the Kyoto court. Uh, the, uh, he appealed. He won in the Osaka High Court. Uh, the prosecutor then appealed. Um, and he was ultimately acquitted in 2011 in, uh, in the uh, Japanese Supreme Court. It was, so it, it was only in 2011 it became clear that a technology that allowed someone else but did not encourage, uh, uh, et cetera, allowed someone else to, to uh, infringe copyright would not result in criminal liability of the proprietor of that software. Now, it's important to point out that, uh, as Minister Fletcher did, uh, that there has been a lot of collaboration now between industry, between Hollywood uh, in the United States and, uh, and uh, uh, Silicon Valley as well. So here uh, we see that in, uh, in YouTube, uh, they have shared some $3 billion with copyright holders who have indicated that they want to share revenues, from, typically from YouTube uploads, um, uh, and YouTube uh, views as opposed to banning their work from YouTube entirely. And I also think it's, it's important to recognize that there's been a huge new kinds of industries that have developed in this process, some of whom, some of those industries seem quite commercially valuable. Uh, there is a whole new category of content creators, the Kim Kardashians of the world, uh, who are now, who earn their income from, uh, from uh, influencing other people. Uh, and so they, they are actually quite, uh, it, this turns out uh, to be a lucrative activity, at least for some influencers online. And of course, it's allowed for the flourishing of fan fiction. This is a, typically a not-for-profit activity, um, and so there's, uh, there's been a, uh, a lot of uh, fan fiction that's available, largely centered uh, around the Harry Potter universe being very, very popular, um, the, uh, the Star Trek universe, and a number of other uh, 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 intellectual property uh, universes. In this context, it's important to recognize that the sites that hold this fan fiction could themselves be illegal under certain laws. 
those sites have clearly, have, are arguably aiding and abetting uh, copyright infringement. The fan fiction author could well be engaging in copyright infringement, making a derivative work of the original uh, intellectual property work. And so fan fiction itself has also relied upon the DMCA to, to uh, survive. That is, the sites that host fan fiction uh, rely on the DMCA to avoid uh, being held liable. Now, this was the slide I was looking for earlier. I kind of misplaced it. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that privacy could well be implicated in some of the discussions of copyright. And in this context, I want to discuss a particular set of cases from the European Court of Justice. So in two cases involving a rights holder group uh, called SEBAM in, in Belgium, the rights holder groups sued two ISPs, internet service providers, because they wanted the service providers to use copyright filters, okay? Uh, and so to be filtering their network of copyright infringing material. That would mean that the ISP would have to monitor what you were doing at every moment online. This is called deep packet inspection. Okay. Um, and so the court struck this down. The contested filtering system would oblige it to actively monitor almost all the data relating uh, to all of its service users in order to prevent any future infringement. It would involve the identification, systematic analysis, and processing information connected with the profiles created on the social networks by its users. Okay. So, uh, so in order to, uh, to uh, uh, to ensure that there wasn't copyright infringing material traveling on its uh, networks, the ISP would have, have, would have had to know exactly what everyone was communicating at every time. On this basis and on and a few other uh, grounds, the Court of Justice said this was not an appropriate obligation to place on these uh, ISPs. These are cases from 2011. Um, copyright can also, in, in today's world, implicate competition. Copyright can impl implicate comp competition in a variety of ways, but I wanted to talk about it in the context of the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things consists of devices, goods, that have software chips on them, hardware and software chips on them. That software is protected by copyright. And so if the software is both protected by copyright and protected by uh, encryption systems, then any tampering with that encryption system without the permission of the copyright holder could be a violation of US law. And this leads to questions as to who can repair a John Deere tractor? Because today's John Deere tractors are actually Internet of Things devices. Okay. They have a lot of software on board. In this context, John Deere says, only we, John Deere, should be able to modify anything on our tractor. Okay. Uh, because otherwise, they argue, this would uh, compromise the, the quality that we would like to assure. Essentially, however, it has the, the possibility of eliminating servicing the John Deere ta tractor at an independent shop. I think this, this kind of question is especially important in a country like Australia, which has a very large uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 landscape, um, and it may be difficult to get your tractor to the right place uh, for, for servicing by the official uh, tractor uh, uh, manufacturer. So an $800,000 tractor that can only be serviced by John Deere. Another area that copyright is, I think, uh, somewhat uh, unprepared for 
is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence in the form of machine learning or deep learning functions on the basis of collecting large data sets and making statistical analyses of those data sets. The data sets may well themselves consist in copyrighted work. And in that context, it may be that uh, you have now made uh, an infringement of those copyrighted works by applying your al algorithm to, to that, those works. Now, within the European Union, they have sought to create an exception for text and data mining. Uh, member states shall provide for an exception or limitation to copyright for reproductions and extractions of lawfully accessible works and other subject matter for the purposes of text and data mining. But other scholars have noted, uh, Christoph Geiger has no and, and his colleagues have noted that copying for this purpose, text and data mining purposes, of online news publications, for example, would trigger potential liability for infringement and thus licensing obligations uh, for, uh, because the uh, DSM, the Digital Single Market Directive, also creates other rights, uh, and the Copyright Directive also creates other rights for news publications, which would interfere with your ability to actually uh, to mine those sources. So um, copyright and, and AI are now linked together because the way AI functions. Now, this is a photo I took in Parliament yesterday. Uh, you'll see here, uh, this might look, you'll see, you, know, you recognize the, the Marvel comic universe here. Uh, this is Iron Man. Uh, it looks like Batman in the back, but this is just homemade costumes, essentially, version of this. Um, it's important to note that uh, exceptions to copyright are often used by uh, creative persons in a, in a variety of ways to create different work. When we comment on culture today, we are relying upon those exceptions for copyright. So I've talked a lot about technology, but I also just wanted to say that this is uh, uh, these kinds of exceptions are, are valuable for a variety of, uh, of ordinary users, um, including ordinary creators. So uh, to conclude, uh, sorry. Um, in 2019, Apple would become the world's first trillion dollar company. Hollywood, at the same time, would be resurgent, with Disney counting no less than seven blockbuster movies, earning more than a billion dollars each. Uh, Disney's market capitalization at the, at the end of 2019 would be a quarter of a trillion dollars. Sony, on the other hand, would be worth not even one-tenth of Apple's value. So I end here with yet another amazing part of the creativity available online. Which, uh, and this is, of course, the Doge meme. Uh, that, uh, at, and one of the great things about this meme is that uh, you can take the original photo and modify it to serve whatever purpose that you think is, is important. And that's the great virtue of uh, copyrighted work as they engage with us online. Thank you very much. Now, um, Anna Pam will, will take questions, uh, so we'll hold you up here just for a few more minutes. Um, do we have any questions so far? Any thoughts for Anna Pam? Oh, here we go. One in the middle there. There's a microphone coming to you. Uh, the day is being live streamed and recorded just for anybody who's worried about what they say online. <laughs> Are any of us? Now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much for that, Anupam. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on AI creating uh, copyrightable works and where you think that frontier is. So, um, I am not. Uh, I, I don't spend much time thinking about that issue, um, and you know, yesterday actually, Jessica's laughing because yesterday we, uh, at, a, at a different talk, I mentioned that I think that there's a couple issues that I think get a lot more attention than they merit, uh, 
and so one of which is, you know, you know, is an AI an author? Um, and so, and you know, we there was a lot of attention to monkey selfies as well. Um, you know, I don't know if you followed that. And I'm, it's, I'm not sure that the issue really um, uh, has much kind of economic significance. Um, uh, in particular, I also the other issue that I complained about was uh, trolley problems in AI, um, which I think are also um, kind of uh, a red herring or a distraction to a large extent. Um, so, um, so, and you can ask me about that as well if, if anyone wants to wants to follow up on that. But um, so, I I'm not a um, so with AI, you know. So here's an example. Uh, you have someone who has created all possible melodies using a brute force method, okay? So do we now think that um, everything in the, you know, it, all music has been, you know, has been created and therefore possibly infringes this, this author's work? Um, uh, I think the answer is clearly no. Um, and so is it creative? Uh, you know, first of all, you might ask, uh, I'm not sure if it has any spark of creativity, if it's a brute force uh, method, uh, but we can imagine some kind of randomization process that maybe just makes it not so brute force uh, that maybe you might say is, is that spark of creativity. But in any case, uh, we could easily imagine AI creating as much work as possible, right? You can create every possible variation of this, of this meme um, you know, in, you know, with, you know, supercomputers uh, in a day, right? Um, and it's, so it's not clear to me that that, that uh, question gets us much, uh, you know, valuable insight. Um, the, the reality is that there are corporations that are going to use AI to create, so today, right now, news is written by AI systems, okay? Some of the wire services that you are consuming are, are, are based entirely, are AI writers, okay? And what they do typically is they take a business press release um, and they uh, examine it for information. So they, their research consists in taking a press release from a company uh, and processing it, or taking a, a, a filing at the SEC and processing it automatically. Right? Because it's very important to get the key information out very quickly. Uh, and so in that context, is it that important that we think of the machine owning it? Or is it, you know, the, it's, it's simply, si simply the fact that the corporation is claiming rights in that information? And I think that's the uh, underlying question. We have a long history of corporate ownership of intellectual property. Uh, and I think that largely answers the practical questions uh, in that context. Other questions? We can talk about the trolley problem. Well, I was about to say, I actually do have a follow-on from that myself, uh, which is, uh, I actually agree with you that I think, I, it is a very fun for those of us who are copyright experts to think about whether or not AI is protected. And in 10 years or so, I imagine, maybe it will become more relevant. But uh, there are a lot of challenges that AI do present to copyright and maybe and to other areas of regulation. Would you like to comment on that? Because that really is the future. Sort of, that's what we do have to start thinking about now: is how do we deal with the regulation required around AIs, both to allow them to exist and to think about uh, managing them in the digital environment. What's your thoughts on that? So, I do think that it's important to, uh, to have exceptions to your copyright law to allow for the use of. Uh, data sets that are not uh, licensed. Um, you may think, oh, well, you should license all the data that you have. Um, that will dramatically limit the, um, what AIs can do. It's very hard to, to actually um, gather data sets, and it also means that the data sets that you use can be can themselves be problematic. So one classic example, and Jessica and I had this, I had this conversation yesterday as well, is uh, this uh, um, popular data set for natural language processing, which comes out of the Enron emails. Okay, So during the process of Enron's bankruptcy, it had to make lots of filings. It made a filing with an agency 
uh, that included all of its emails, okay, um, so that it could, they could be examined for wrongdoing. Um, the corporation is now defunct. There is no Enron. Um, and uh, so you have a possible copyright holder that no longer exists. And you have a, a government agency that has made this data available to the world as part of its, you know, the natural course of uh, court filings be being made public. Uh, so the Enron emails are now used to train computers on how people talk. Uh, that is a peculiar way to understand the world, right? To have the people who worked at this uh, largely a kind of energy brokerage, uh, uh, the m largely male people who worked at this brokerage that went under for fraud, uh, it to it to be used to train computers on how to how to understand the world, uh, and so uh, so uh, expanding out the uh, the range of data sets is I think uh, critical. Uh, and I, if you look at uh, AI companies, uh, you know, they are, you know, I think united in asking for uh, a tax and data mining exception to, to the laws. And as I said, in Europe, you, you do see this, uh, this uh, exception. The European exception has expanded from its original proposal because it was very constricted originally, uh, but it does rate, there are questions as to exactly its scope uh, that have yet to be kind of hashed out. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have other questions for Anna Palm? Anybody? Here we go. Peter Martin, back. I've got a question. As something I've always wanted to know from the, well, wanted to know for 20 years, from the beginning of your talk, could Google have started in Australia? Um, thank you for that question. Um, so Prime Minister David Cameron has an answer for you. So he says Google could not have been launched in the UK. Okay. Um, so Prime Minister David Cameron at that time was arguing for fair use, by the way. And so this is the context in which he uh, reports this. He says that Larry and, uh, and Sergey, uh, the co-founders of Google, told him that they could not have launched their, image, uh, their Google search index um, in uh, the UK at all. Why, you know, it wasn't because of lack of engineers or a lack of money, uh, because there are plenty of you know, smart people within, within the UK, and there's a lot of money in the city of London, certainly. Um, it was because of copyright. Uh, and so doing the, the, so essentially taking a search in index means copying all the world's information in some way or another, okay, and dismantling it. Okay, in order to create your search index. Uh, and so the search index literally, like, like a card index, I'm seeking a library and there are librarians I believe in the room, uh, you know, literally consists in snippets of information that are put into that index. Okay? There's a large compilation of index uh, in that process. Um, and Larry and Sergey told David Cameron this, that they could not have launched uh, Google in, in the UK. In Japan, um, Google and Yahoo Japan both ran their search servers from offshore because it wasn't legal to do search in Japan. Okay, so they ran Japanese language search from Singapore or some other jurisdiction, okay, uh, and served the Japanese market. Uh, and so, and Japan did modify its law to create a search engine exception in 2011, uh, but quite late in the game, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, so I think that I suspect, and I, so I'm, my suspicion is that the answer may be exactly the same for Australia. I don't claim to be an expert in Australian law, but given two uh, examples of jurisdictions where da Prime Minister David Cameron says, uh, he doesn't say it is illegal, he says the Google folks told me it was illegal. I should also say there's some, I've talked with some Google folks who say, 
no, we never actually told him that. <laughs> but uh, uh, so there's a question as to whether or not that actually, you know, uh, there was that conversation. Uh, but, uh, but in the context of trying to create a more flexible regime in, in the UK that would allow for technologies to do what they uh, do. Now, it might be argued um, that this stuff happens anyway. Okay, so there isn't much punishment for search engine indexing as you go across the world. But here's the, here's the part of this that I think is, is critical, uh, which is if you are an investor in an enterprise, um, in a jurisdiction where the fundamental activity of that enterprise is illegal, I think you would say maybe even if the authorities aren't coming down on you today, and there's, uh, there's no activity that suggests that, it's at, you know, that that is coming in the future, you would probably say, maybe this isn't the right jurisdiction to try out this new activity. Uh, and I think that's the, uh, you know, so the fact that there isn't much enforcement activity against search engine indexing across the world, I think that's true. Um, the fact that it may technically be illegal in those jurisdictions uh, is enough to ward off a lot of companies because of the fact that you need to have lots of financing for those companies to do what they do, and that financing will require an analysis of the legal terrain and the legal risks. And do we have, we probably have time for another question. Ah, Tom Cochran down the front. No, thanks, for, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me there? Yeah. Uh, look, look, it's really something, uh, a comment for you to perhaps comment on, which is your earlier observation about the apparent paradox in which US innovation has occurred under the fair use regime, but in bilateral and multilateral settings, it seems to argue against it. Another way of seeing that is to maintain an advantage in innovation in perpetuity. Um, I, look, I think that may well... <laughs> who, um, so. There are two possible explanations, both, I think, truly problematic, which is that um, the uh, content industries having uh, lost battles in the United States um, seek to ensure that uh, they have the upper hand elsewhere, um, and two, that um, we don't have competitors to our uh, technology-leading enterprises. Uh, and I think both are truly problematic. Yeah. So I would, if I were South Africa, forage right ahead with fair use and <laughs> ignore the USTR. And uh, and uh, you know, uh, I think there's there's a tremendous amount of chest thumping from the United States on trade matters. Uh, and uh, um, I think uh, you know, obviously the the U.S. has done this in this kind of bilateral or unilateral settings. Uh, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, at that point, it may be useful for other countries to band together to say, no, these kinds of exceptions, you have them in your law. Whether it's done through explicit statutory exceptions, you know, which is possible, uh, as the Europeans have done with text and data mining, uh, or through a broader fair use-like regime, which, is, uh, you know, which uh, uh, doesn't enumerate the, the permissive, permitted uses, um, I think it would be useful for countries across the world to have a joint uh, uh, approach to this, uh, which uh, you know, stands up a little bit to the United States on, on this question. Uh, for those who don't get the reference, am I on? Yes. Uh, the uh, USDR, I think, has formally threatened, I don't know if you know, uh, sanctions against South Africa because they are looking at introducing fair use at the moment. Yeah, I think it's yeah. under one of the agreements that they work under, I can't remember which one. Um, any other questions? Uh -huh. uh, Graham Greenleaf, Annapal. Um, I'm inclined to agree that uh, fair dealing, or oh, sorry, fair use, made Google uh, possible to be built, but it didn't make it commercially successful, and it had no commercial success initially as a search engine. And, I mean, if you follow um, Shazana Zuboff's arguments, then it was the discovery uh, that the uh, usage, the digital exhaust of the users of the search engine 
was what gave Google a product that it could sell to others. So I think that raises the, the question, uh, could Google possibly have succeeded if the United States had anything resembling privacy protections mm. in its laws? Do you, do you have to completely surrender your privacy in order for there to be any commercially successful innovations? So, I, uh, so you know, you're absolutely right about that history. The history is exactly as you said, uh, which is Google was a loss-making enterprise. In the first few years, it ran zero ads. Um, uh, YouTube, for a long time, didn't have it had some ads on the side. It didn't have uh, the B-roll that starts off the ads that was introduced uh, later. Uh, and so, uh, so um, uh, advertising was uh, a kind of uh, later way to figure out a business model. Uh, so <laughs> Google, I don't think, had a clear business model for, uh, at the start, but, uh, but it had this tremendous technology. Uh, and the question then is, I think a very important question, uh, is it possible to have a, a business model uh, for Google that is privacy respecting? Uh, and I think, I think for companies, whether it's Google or any other company, uh, I think that's, uh, that's obviously what we all want. We want you know, companies to, uh, to, to not have uh, to do whatever they want with their, our data. I want to point out a couple things about US law that, that are, you know, and I know, Professor Greenleaf, you are the uh, world expert on comparative privacy law, uh, and uh, certainly, uh, so, uh, you know, you are, uh, you know, uh, respected the world over on, on that subject. Um, the, the U.S. did have uh, laws that said you had to have a privacy policy. Now, it, it didn't have any requirements as to what that privacy policy must say. Uh, but in, the con in that context, essentially, companies made privacy commitments. Uh, and those privacy commitments were backed by uh, two things that were both frightening for these companies. Uh, one, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and two, and even more frightening, uh, class action lawyers. Uh, and so uh, you have in the US lots of judgments along the way uh, about uh, privacy uh, 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 protections that were promised uh, and weren't delivered. Uh, and the US actually has much more in the way of high damage awards uh, than, the, than Europe um, in, uh, in this context. And let me give you an example in that context. So everyone's familiar with the Cambridge Analytica debacle uh, in 2016 uh, uh, with respect to Facebook. Uh, and so, uh, as you know, Facebook's uh, uh, allowed a researcher at Cambridge University to, uh, to uh, run an app on Facebook. The app basically was a kind of behavioral research, uh, and it was a kind of cute app, uh, but it allowed that person, so I think it was downloaded a couple hundred th thousand times, but Facebook's API, its, uh, its system, allowed this company to learn not only um, as, the, as the user authorized that app, he or she also authorized that app to learn of the this information of his or her friends. Okay, So and in that context, Cambridge Analytica gained information about uh, millions of people even though it was only given originally information uh, directly by a couple hundred thousand people. Um, and then that information was collected, and Cambridge Analytica used that as a business model to sell its services to uh, target kind of political ads to people, okay? So, which was hugely problematic. So that whole debacle was uh, tremendously uh, awful and, and, and uh, you know, a threat to democracy, certainly. Um, there were two actions taken uh, against uh, Facebook. One in uh, the United States by the FTC, the other in the United Kingdom by, I'm sorry, in, the, in, in Ireland uh, by the ICO. No, the UK, it was, it was, it was the UK, sorry. It was the UC, UK I, ICO, the, um, the Data Protection Authority within, within uh, the UK. Um, 
In the UK, the penalty was 500,000 um, pounds. In the United States, the penalty was five billion dollars. Okay, so uh, there was violations of laws on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, this was Cambridge Analytica, a, a company based in the UK, obviously, uh, that was a, at the heart of the scandal, along with Facebook. Uh, and so, uh, even though Europe has very significant, and obviously that's pre-GDPR, pre so I understand, uh, Professor Greenleaf, uh, it's the pre-GDPR uh, sum, but post-GDPR, the five billion dollar figure is, is about twice as much as what the maximum fine would have been post GDPR. Uh, you know, so it's uh, you know four percent of global turnover, uh, which is uh, um, so five percent. Uh, five billion was actually uh, about double four percent of uh, global turnover. Uh, so I think it's uh, uh, so. My point there is that it's not clearly the case that currently uh, one has no rights uh, with respect to privacy. Uh, I teach information privacy law, uh, and you know, we spend a, a semester, and I could spend a year teaching the subject uh, because there's, there is a lot of privacy law to teach. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and we're seeing huge developments in this space as well, which is the California law, uh, which is kind of de facto the national law uh, in the United States um, uh, that I think does a, a ton of work in improving U.S. privacy law. None of this is to say that U.S. privacy law is where it should be, and I think Professor Greenleaf, uh, who has been critical of U.S. privacy law, is exactly right on all that. But I just want to say it's not that there's zero in the United States. It's, it's that there, there, is, uh, there is some. And really, in the United States, what we do have enforcement. That's the one thing that we that's different than many other jurisdictions, which often have beautiful laws and little enforcement. And we have uh, terrifying penalties, including terrifying class action lawyers, whom I help train. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I know we have another question. Rebecca Gibbons. Uh, so that leads really nicely into what I wanted to ask about, which is this growing anti-platform sentiment, which has lots of reasons behind it. You know, first of all, uh, the, the disruption of revenue flows from advertising, because that can be done much better and uh, more effectively online than in old media, which caused lots of uh, um, negative sentiment towards the, the winners of that, including Google. And then, of course, we have the growing monopsony power or buyer power of um, organizations like Amazon that are really exercising that in ways that put enormous download, uh, downwards pressure on prices for, for publishers and then what cre creators can get in exchange. And, of course, the threat to democracy, the Cambridge Analytica-style absolute sort of uh, terrifying... Um, um, developments there where we realize that there's a handful of companies in the world that can kind of control you know what our future looks like and so just against that backdrop do you have any thoughts about what that anti-platform sentiment means for future reform in these areas how is that playing in and is it helpful or unhelpful to the development of good evidence-based policy to fix these problems? So I think that's, it's all you know, truly valuable and important concerns, and I think all of them are uh, serious concerns that have to be attended to. Uh, uh, and I think of you know, another, I would add another, which is the gig economy, uh, you know, which is uh, I think we have to really think about kind of, uh, you know, I see that Uber and Ola and various other platforms are popular here, you know, to make sure that the, the, uh, the individuals are, are uh, protected in that process. Um, so uh, I think all of those concerns are, are truly valid. And it's important, to, you know, as, as an observer from DC, I should note that those, are, those same concerns are very much in the mainstream in the United States as well. Uh, and so trying to figure out uh, how to deal with those ills of these companies, uh, the disruption of traditional businesses, uh, which is you know, hugely problematic, uh, the, you know, the dying of local newspapers in that context is, uh, is particularly salient. Uh, I want to note one thing about that, uh, the local newspapers. Um, it's that uh, local newspapers really, uh, the threat to them um, has largely been from uh, the loss of classified ads, 
Um, and you know, I, I know you have Gumtree. You know, uh, these kinds of platforms are actually uh, the the ones that you know. And in the United States, Craigslist, uh, you know, is the is the kind of big company that's taken up uh, classified ads. And the reason that people moved in the United States to Craigslist was because it was free, uh, and, and it had photos of whatever you were selling. So I used to sell my you know when I had a car that I would sell, uh, I would sell it. Uh, using, you know, buying an ad. I remember buying an ad in the LA Times, you know, very closely, uh, you know, figuring out how many, what I could squeeze into 20 characters. Uh, I don't know if you have had a similar experience in, the, in, in Australia, uh, you know, and now, you know, when I've sold cars more recently, uh, I, I just, Put up 20 images of the car. Uh, I don't have to spell BL in black with BLK or something like that. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's changed the way we, we engage these things. But at the same time, it's made uh, the revenue source from classifieds go away for uh, small uh, newspapers. And I think that's been a tremendous problem uh, that's arisen. And I don't know exactly how to solve that problem, because we're not going to tell people you can't use an online bulletin board to, uh, to do this so that you must, uh, you know, um, to, must use the uh, restore the original um, uh, you know, newspaper. In the United States, it's turning out that the New York Times is doing well. Uh, so you also kind of see kind of uh, uh, winner take all, you know, in the uh, in in this in that industry, um, and so um, if you can get the New York Times now, it may not make sense to pay for uh, for a relatively inexpensive amount. It may not make make much sense to pay more for a local paper. So if you're sitting in uh, you know a small town in, in California, um, that you may not. Uh, it, need to pay more for getting the local paper than you would for a digital subscription to the New York Times. Uh, and so those kinds of questions are arising, and I think those, those are hugely, prop, you know, uh, we have tremendous uh, uh, pressures in that context. It's, and I'm not sure exactly what the solutions are. I do think that there's uh, reason to think about, uh, you know, public funding. Uh, in, in those contexts, uh, I think it's important to make sure taxation is, you know, especially in the digital context, is uh, is fair, uh, and so uh, so um, uh, you know profits are being taxed, uh, uh, you know, uh, as appropriate uh, across the world, and I think that is uh, you know could be a way to make sure that there is enough uh, revenues to uh, to support the the things that need to be uh, to be supported locally, um, but I think. Generally, the uh, uh, my concern in general, in the, in the context of thinking about you know a handful of platforms, um, is that the reality is that the law isn't even if it's written with platforms in mind, the five companies in mind, or four companies in mind, or two companies in mind, uh, it's going to encompass a host of other companies, uh, and so uh, so. You don't just write a law to regulate Facebook. You write a law to regulate uh, this particular activity, uh, and that means that you will incidentally or accidentally swallow up a lot of other companies in that process that you that you may not have intended to target. So, uh, the question of kind of legislating out of kind of uh, a desire to kind of push these companies back. Can be can lead you to uh, accidentally, uh, you know, hamper your own enterprise in, in that process as well. Uh, and so I think it's uh, you know those are those are important questions. But trying to figure out uh, what the uh, ramifications are of the of the statutes that you're considering would be uh, would be obviously something to think about as well. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you all.